Um, yeah, so I'm from uh, the Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease, and we are uh, funded in part through New York State Department of Health to help expand knowledge about Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, we are a resource for um, the general community as well as healthcare providers out on Long Island and Saf Suffolk and Nas Nassau County. And our, our goal is to um, help to um, improve access to screening, diagnosis, and treatment for patients and their families. So, um, what I want to talk to you today about um, is the following. So, you know, folks are often a little worried as we get a little older about a decline in memory or thinking abilities. It's a fairly common problem, right? Or a fairly common concern, right? Um, so I'm gonna describe some normal changes that do take place as we get a little older and try to distinguish those from some of the early symptoms that are associated with different forms of dementia. And so I'll provide an overview of what dementia is with a focus on one particular disease, which is Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common form of this general disorder. And then I'll discuss lifestyle changes that can help to reduce our chances of developing um, any one of these. And, um, and I'm happy to take questions afterwards. I know some of you um, asked some questions beforehand when you signed up and I'll try to answer some of those that seemed unusual and some of the other ones I'm hoping will be answered as I go along. So as I mentioned, you know, the concern with cognitive decline is fairly common. Um, you know, one in nine New Yorkers who are 45 years old and older have these kinds of concerns. And that, you know, the 45 year old cutoff is, is fairly young as far as I'm concerned. Um, so most of these people have not talked to their doctors and most of these people realistically are, are fine. They do not have any sort of a neurodegenerative disorder, no sort of dementia, um, but um, you know, it, it's just to show you that there is this concern out there. So what is dementia? Let me um, try to define some of these terms, okay? Dementia is a general uh, category. It refers to um, when an individual is showing a long-term and often gradual decrease in their ability to think and remember. And it becomes severe enough that it interferes with their ability to carry out their daily activities, whether it's uh, social activities or work activities or just you know, basic activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living. Things like um, you know, uh, um, driving, managing medications, um, um, trying to manage finances, things like that. Um, there are other folks who are having some cognitive problems, a decline in their cognitive abilities. It could be memory, it could be something else. Um, but these folks, at, the, at least at the point that we're seeing them, are able to go on with their daily lives. They might require a little more effort than they are used to, but they're able to do the things that they need to do independently, relatively independently. And both of these terms, dementia and mild cognitive impairment, um, don't refer to a specific disease. It, 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 they can result from a variety of diseases, and they usually affect us as we get older. Um, so we refer to them as umbrella terms. So someone could have dementia because they have Alzheimer's disease. They could have dementia because they have Lewy body dementia or frontotemporal dementia or vascular dementia um, or some combination of those. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease is a specific type of, uh, of disease that causes dementia. It's a kind of dementia. So that's how it's different. Alzheimer's and dementia are not the same thing. Dementia is this big umbrella. Alzheimer's is one of the things that falls underneath it. Um, so dementia is a, a global as well as a, a local problem. Um, it affects uh, probably over 50 million people by now. I think my my, um, my uh, numbers are a little bit, you know, a couple of years behind. Uh, over 50 million people around the world. Here in the United States, it's about over, it's over 6 million. We spend about a trillion dollars, a trillion, that's with a T, every year um, um, trying to treat these diseases. And in the United States, we spend uh, well over a quarter of a trillion dollars 
every year treating this disease. And that doesn't include another quarter of a trillion dollars or so that um, families and, um, and loved ones provide to, to, the, to the individuals that they know and love that have this disorder, these disorders. So um, if someone is showing cognitive decline, it can uh, be caused by a variety of different things. As I mentioned, there's, a, you know, there's Alzheimer's disease, there's all these other kinds of dementia that I mentioned. Um, but there are also a number of, uh, and, and, and we don't have cures for these. Uh, I'm sorry to say that people are working on, on, uh, on these issues. We can't cure them. We can control some of the symptoms. We can improve people's lives. We can um, improve their, the quality of their lives. We can um, reduce some of the cognitive impairment uh, or, or stabilize it, uh, but we can't cure them yet. Um, but there are a number of, of reversible uh, um, reasons that are that are that could cause cognitive decline, and among those are, are vitamin deficiencies, uh, medication side effects, um, changes in thyroid function, um, um, uh, dehydration, urinary tract infections. All these things um, uh, can can uh, lead to these cognitive changes, um, and it's just one of the reasons that. It's important to reach out to your um, to the, your healthcare provider, your primary care physician, to to uh, rule out any of these uh, causes, and to um, and and early diagnosis of people who do have these disorders still um, uh, leads to better care. People who are diagnosed early tend to be able to uh, have a better quality of life. Their symptoms can be um, uh, controlled. Their, um, um, their, their, their families do better by understanding and knowing what's going on. And there's uh, um, care and, and respite available to both patients and, and family members. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. Um, and it's, it's a progressive and an ultimately fatal disorder. It slowly destroys memory and thinking skills. Um, and and it, the important thing is that it is not uh, part of normal aging, okay? Um, it is the case, however, that age is the biggest risk factor in developing this disease. Um, and so um, the, the odds of someone having it increase as we get older, but it's not a normal part of aging. Um, it is more common in, um, in some folks than others. So it's more common in women than it is in men. Uh, about almost two thirds are, are women as opposed to men. Part of that reason is that women tend to live a little bit longer than men. And so the older that you get, the more likely you are to develop this disease. But it's not, it seems to be more than that. And there's ongoing research to look at that, to look at uh, hormonal factors and other things that might be at play, but uh, there are, are no definitive answers yet. We also know that it's more common in some uh, subgroups of our population. So it's more common in African-American and Hispanic populations than, than, in, uh, than in others. Um, and uh, we don't know the reasons for that either. We, we do know that there is some link to socioeconomic status and to education. And so it might be um, impacted by those things. Um, but again, uh, these are areas that are under investigation right now. When we talk about Alzheimer's disease, the reason we call it Alzheimer's disease is because we, at least in part, because we see um, um, changes in proteins inside the brain that are, that are abnormal. There's the development of these uh, amyloid plaques, beta amyloid plaques that occur and destroy the communication between brain cells, the, the neurons that carry the information. Uh, these plaques dis, um, um, interrupt and destroy that. There are also tau um, tangles that occur inside the, the cells themselves and again, kill the cells and impact um, communication and lead to it, um, inflammation. We don't know what the initial original cause is of the, of the disorder. That's still under investigation. But these two are the sort of the primary suspects, as, along with inflammation, which we believe is important. And um, uh, so that's what distinguishes the brains of people who have Alzheimer's disease specifically from, from those who don't. Um, a lot of people are worried because so many of us know someone 
who has this disorder and some, you know, often a close relative. Um, and so it's important to, to, I think, for me to tell you a little bit about um, some of the genetic basis of, of the disorder. For the most part, people develop Alzheimer's disease after the age of 65. And as you saw that, that um, uh, figure I showed you before, it gets even more after you're 85 years of age and, and, and above. So it increases with age. But there are some people who get the disorder fairly young, younger than 65. That's very uncommon. But that form of Alzheimer's disease is uh, tends to be, or, or those forms of Alzheimer's disease do tend to be more strongly genetically linked. So that if you have uh, a genetic mutation um, that, um, that is associated with that early onset form, it's very likely that you will get the disorder. But the other um, um, more common uh, um, form of Alzheimer's is the one that hits us when we are older. And um, that, that form is much less uh, strongly genetically linked as far as we know at this point. So there is some increased risk. There are some genes that, that confer some in increased risk, but it's by no means a sure thing. Um, so I mentioned that um, people get concerned that they're, they're, um, they're, 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 they're not thinking like they used to as they get a little bit older. And so it is important to understand that there are some cognitive changes that do take place as we get older. So I want to talk about what, what changes should be are normal and what are not. So um, in order to do that, I want to back up a little bit and just talk about what brains are doing in the first place. Okay. And this is your this is your guess, or excuse me, this is your your um, your clue. Okay. Um, and what this is mean, meaning to give you a clue of is that our, our brains are acting like crystal balls. Our brains are, remember, our brains are inside our skulls, right? They don't have any access to this outside world. They don't really know what's going on. They don't have access to the inside world. They're, they're just this clump of cells up here inside of our skulls. They get information, electrical signals and chemical signals, and they have to make sense of that. So our brains are always trying to to um, come up with a, the best guess for what's going on and to predict what's going to happen in the future and then help us to adjust and figure out, figure out what to do. And so um, more and more scientists are, are, are calling the brain a prediction machine, a prediction machine. Ba this Bayesian brain thing is just that uh, it, you, uh, a particular kind of approach to making those predictions. Um, so um, as an example, Say you and your brain are sitting down, you're having some coffee, or maybe you're going to read a book, when all of a sudden you hear this noise, right? Unexpected. And you have to try to figure out what that is. Well, how do you figure that out? Well, you have the noise itself, right? That current sensory input, the noise that started the whole thing. But you also come into the situation with some prior knowledge. So what if you knew already that um, it was windy outside, right? You've got some windy weather conditions, and you've got some trees that are close to the, to the house, and they, maybe they're brushing up against the house, and maybe that's the source of the noise, right? So you're using that prior knowledge to help you make a, a hypothesis, a best guess about what's going on. But what if instead you knew that there had been a string of break-ins in your neighborhood, right? That might lead you to make a, a completely different guess as to what's going on and a, a completely different response to what is going on, right? How do you react to what's going on, right? And either one of these could be right or neither one of them could be right, but they are, they are the guess that our brain makes to try to make sense of the world. Um, some things are easier to figure out than others, but we're always trying to do the best we can, right? So our brains are, are geared um, there's so much going on out there in the world and within our, our bodies themselves, our brain is connected to the, our internal organs as well. Um, and the brain is always just trying to figure out, well, what's important? You know, what do I need this to stay alive and, to, and, to, and appropriate? You know, uh, I need food, I need shelter, I need the temperature of a certain, uh, of a certain range, um, all these things. And then um, once I know what the things are that are important, I have to figure out what to do about them, right? So if I like bananas, I've got to figure out how to get a banana. Do I climb a tree? Do I go to the store? Do I have to drive? Do I have, you know, um, 
how do I go about doing that? So those are the two basic, very basic things that the brain helps us to do. Um, so when we're young, all of this is new to us, right? It's hard for us to know what's important. Maybe we know that, that mommy and daddy are important, but um, you know, what is important out there? We figure that out slowly over time. Um, we, we've, we develop some words to describe all those things, but initially it's all a little new and, and maybe a little bit scary, right? But over time, we, um, we develop some wisdom, hopefully some expertise, at least with those situations that we're familiar with. And, um, and so things you know, are, are more predictable for us, but they're also a little bit not as fresh, right? It's that same old, same old, a little, a little bit, right? We can, we can um, uh, take for granted some things that we've seen before, like it's cold again or it's warm again. Yeah, I've been there, right? And it is a little more difficult for us to be flexible in the way that we respond because we are holding on to those old tricks that we've already known. Um, and it's a little harder for us to learn those new tricks. Not impossible, but a little harder, right? And um, and then underneath it, you know, it, it, what we've learned along the way is good enough. We're not dead yet. That's, that's what I mean by good enough. It's been good enough to keep us alive so far. It doesn't mean it's correct um, uh, in each case and most likely isn't. Um, but we do become creatures of habit over time, right? We regularly repeat the same behaviors in the same situations. About 40% of our behavior is, is kind of um, uh, habitual, or at least it used to be, right? Until this came along, right? So there's a lot of horrible things that the coronavirus has done. But one of the things that it uh, hopefully has taught us is that we took a lot for granted. We, you know, uh, went about our lives on automatic pilot in ways that we didn't appreciate in terms of, you know, where we got our coffee in the morning, um, who we saw during the day, how we worked and, 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 and socialized. Um, all these things changed and, and they changed back again and then they changed and, you know, we're all in, in the middle of this, right? We've got had these normals. So we've gone through the, 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 the toilet paper uh, crisis, right? Where we couldn't find any toilet paper in there. We figured out what, what these new pictures of, of, you know, these circles with these red bumps on it and, and masks, you know, became something that we had to deal with. So all this stuff was new and, that, and it showed us, uh, I think, that um, we took a lot for granted and that a lot of the things that were habitual um, uh, uh, couldn't be, or, or, or you know, we're, we're yearning for that new normal. Um, so what changes take place with normal aging? I mentioned uh, that some things become more automatic and that, um, um, and so that is, uh, that is um, driven. So in, the, in this graph, I've got, um, you see a bunch of, of lines that are kind of going down towards the right. Um, you know, we, we, there are things like speed of information processing, our working memory or ability to hold on to a little bit of information because we can only hold on to a certain amount at any given time, as well as our ability to learn new infor information and get that into long-term memory. All those things do tend to decline to a degree as we get a little older. On the other hand, our world knowledge, our knowledge of facts, our knowledge of our knowledge of a lot of those things that they ask on Jeopardy, right? There, there are things that we learned quite some time ago. There are there, there, it might be our it could also be our expertise in our particular job or in, in um, you know um, dealing with the people that are around us. The things that we've learned over time, those things tend to stay. Our world knowledge it could be reflected in our vocabulary, it could be reflected in other. Um, things that we carry out during the uh, during our daily lives. So, what what kinds of things can distinguish these normal changes in aging from um, what could be early signs of a dementia, Alzheimer's disease, or some other form of dementia? Well, um, there isn't any one particular um, pro cognitive problem that's going to say, "Oh, that's it. That's dementia." But there are certain kinds of early signs that you can look for. And if you see a few of these, you might want to uh, check in with your healthcare provider um, and, and, and discuss some of these things with them. So, um, you know, it's 
a, it's typical for someone, uh, whether they're old or not, to occasionally forget a name or to occasionally forget an appointment, but then later remember it. Um, but um, it, it, if someone is um, uh, asking the same questions over and over again, over, you know, uh, every day the person asks the same question or every hour the person asks the same question, or even if it's just like every week, you know, I have to go over this with you. Mom, I, I mentioned that to you, don't you remember? Um, sometimes people do that because they don't remember asking the question. Sometimes they do that because they don't remember what the answer was that you gave them. But that can be an early sign that there might be something going on. Um, it's typical for people to perhaps on occasion forget what day it is or the exact date of the month. Um, but if you don't know what the month is or you know, you're off by more than one month or you're off by, you know, you think it, it's, it's winter when it's summer, um, you don't know what the year is when, once it's past maybe February, right? Or, um, you are, your brain may not be keeping up with the changes that are taking place out there in the world. And, and that can sometimes be a sign that um, something might be going on. Um, there can be changes um, in vision uh, that can also be indicative, not that your vision declines and you can't read uh, the signs, uh, you know, the, the street signs, but that you might not understand what it is that you're seeing. So someone um, with dementia might uh, walk down a hall and pass a mirror and see their own reflection in the mirror, but not realize it's them, think it's somebody else, right? That's misunderstanding what you see. It's not the seeing itself. It's the, it's the not understanding the meaning of what you see. There can also be changes in judgment, you know. Um, you know, we all, uh, scammers are, are becoming increasingly sophisticated at, at getting at us, whether it's by phone or by uh, emails or, um, you know, all in-person scams. There's all kinds of things, and they're getting better at them, in fact. Um, so we all have to be wary, but um, people who are cognitively uh, vulnerable and, and maybe experiencing some cognitive decline are especially vulnerable. And it's very important that we try to protect them. So, um, you know, because they might be at an increased risk of losing money to telemarketers and scams. And um, another indication of, of just um, a change in, in judgment um, could be just less attention to grooming or hygiene. What, what you're looking for oftentimes are changes in the way the person used to be. So some people are very particular about how they, you know, how their hair is, is, is combed and how they dress. And if you see a, a big change in that, that can sometimes be an early sign. Um, sometimes the changes that we see and that we need to pay attention to involve, uh, seem to be more mood related or, or psychiatric. So um, someone might um, have a change in their mood or a change in their personality, become more negative or become more apathetic so that they don't seem to care about anything. Um, they might withdraw from work or from social activities. And it's, and it's certainly the case that that person could be depressed or anxious or stressed or you know, uh, experiencing some um, uh, psychological problem, but it is also the case that that, that that could be an early sign of a dementia. And so it's important. You can treat um, you know, um, depression and all these other kinds of um, mood disorders and other, other sorts of things. So it's important to try to get um, uh, treatment for these things. Um, it's not that uncommon for people to misplace items from time to time. I myself have actually done that. <laughs> Just ask my wife. Um, but when we start putting um, things in unusual places, like our glasses end up in a refrigerator, um, or um, you know that that's kind of more of a, a reason for concern. Sometimes people who are experiencing a cognitive decline may accuse others of stealing their stuff. Right? That can sometimes be because they don't realize themselves that they don't remember. Right? So if their stuff is missing and they don't think they, they think they, they know where it what should have been, they might not realize that they're misremembering the situation, right? That they did themselves put it somewhere, but they don't 
know where that might be, right? So as I said, our brains are always trying to figure out what's going on. And so this, um, you know, they, their brain might lead them to the conclusion that someone stole their stuff. It is, if it isn't where they first thought they, they uh, left it. Um, there can also sometimes be um, changes to completing familiar tasks, uh, driving to a familiar location, or um, um, trouble following a, a recipe. So these are all sort of common signs that can sometimes occur and be an indication that, that you should follow up with your doctor. Um, so none of us want these disorders, right? So what can we do to try to lower our odds? There's not, not, there's no surefire way to do that, but 40, 40%, four out of 10 uh, 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 of our risk can be sort of, a, appears to be affected by um, what we call lifestyle modifications. So I want to talk to you about some of these lifestyle modifications, and they have an impact on in preventing dementia in three ways. One is, uh, is this blue circle up at the top in the middle. And, and it's the, defined as increasing brain cognitive reserve. So how do you do that? That sounds like it would be a good thing to do. But one way is through education. People who have more education tend to um, have a, a, a decreased risk of, of dementia at any given um, age. Um, and lifelong education, so staying engaged, learning something new that is a, is a way that you can help. Um, preserving your senses is important. Preserving your hearing, preserving your vision. I'll talk a little bit more about those later. Um, uh, there are, you know, cognitive games, Sudoku, Wordle. I love Wordle. Um, uh, different things that we can do. Um, and those might have some impact, although the jury's still out in terms of how much. Um, so what's an, what's another way that people can reduce the, you know, help to prevent these dementias? One is to reduce brain damage. That's this lower left um, kind of um, peachy uh, colored um, circle. And you can do that through things like um, uh, uh, treating hypertension, high blood, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, treating metabolic disorders, like, um, like diabetes, um, uh, uh, stopping smoking. These are all ways that you can try to re reduce brain damage. Um, and the last way is by reducing brain inflammation. That's that lower right um, uh, circle there. And um, uh, you can do that through diet as well as some other things. But one of the things that you might notice is that these circles overlap. And right there in the very center of, that, of all those circles is something that impacts all of these areas and can be helpful in all these ways. And that's exercise or physical activity. It's just moving. It's just doing anything other than what I'm doing, which is sitting down, um, what you're probably doing, sitting down, right? A walking, um, uh, uh, gardening, dancing, uh, playing tennis, uh, playing golf, um, uh, doing the laundry, uh, walking up and down the stairs. Um, all of these things count as, as physical activity, just about anything other than what we're doing. Okay, so how does that impact the brain? Well, one of the ways that it does that is by reducing inflammation. Remember, I was talking to you about uh, inflammation being one of the pathways to prevention. And um, we have found uh, that as scientists and, 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 and uh, healthcare researchers have found that inflammation, chronic, what we call chronic inflammation, long lasting inflammation is related to a whole bunch of diseases, including all these brain diseases that we're worried about, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease and um, uh, other forms of dementia. And um, so reducing chronic inflammation is helpful and exercise helps us do that. And um, so um, let me give you, help you understand this by way of, of an example. Let's say you exercise, let's say you're lifting weights or using your arm in some way that you didn't normally do. 
that, that next day you might notice some soreness in your arm, right? It's a, your muscles a little sore, it's kind of adapting to that stuff, but that's due to some inflammatory process, but it's what we call acute inflammation. But over, over time, over a few days, that's gonna reduce and it's gonna go away. And exercise in general um, causes that acute inflammation, but then a reduction, a reduction, a, a lowering of overall chronic inflammation. And that seems to be one way that it helps us uh, to, to, to lower our risks of a dementia. The other thing that it does is that it helps make new brain cells. Now we, until you know, maybe 30 years ago, we didn't think our adult brains made new brain cells. We thought that once we were you know, out of childhood, that was all the brain we had and we better take care of it. Well, it is uh, uh, most of what we have and it is something we definitely have to take care of, but it turns out that we are producing new brain cells all the time in areas that are important for new learning and memory, like the hippocampus, which is kind of right there in the center of the brain. And it turns out that exercise helps to increase the rate at which we do that. So these are two ways that, that exercise helps. Um, and there's good news for exercise, not only um, in terms of uh, helping to lower your risk of getting a, a, a Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, but also helping to treat it. That is, Exercise improves the ability of people who have Alzheimer's disease and who have mild cognitive impairment. Uh, it improves their ability to think, uh, to process information, to be flexible in the way that they uh, understand the world, to remember things. Um, and it's especially aerobic exercise that is, that is helpful. Um, aerobic exercise is anything that gets our heart rate increased a little bit or our breathing a little bit heavier that counts as aerobic exercise. Walking is perfect. Um, running is great. Cycling, you know, going up and down the stairs. You might not like it, but it's good exercise, right? Um, and um, how much do you need to do? Well, these studies, this is, uh, I, I'm giving you the results of a combination of about almost 20 different studies that are all assigned people randomly to either getting some exercise or some other kind of treatment that wasn't aerobic exercise. And the ones who got the aerobic exercise had these, these effects and the effects are fairly strong. And the amount of exercise was about three, four times a week, um, 30, 40 minutes of exercise at a time. Is that the lower limit? Is that you have to have that much in order to have an effect? Probably not. There's probably some effect of, of, some, of doing it somewhat less. We don't know exactly what the right dosage is. So usually when people ask me, you know, what's the right amount and what, what should they do it? I usually just tell them to do a little bit more than what they're doing now and, and sort of gradually try to do a little bit more as they go along. Um, when it, exercise and, and physical activity is extremely important, not only for our brain health, but for our general health. People who exercise or people who just move a little bit are more likely to be alive a couple of years from now by a, a fairly large amount. And it's the people in terms of our general health and our being alive, right, in terms of our mortality, the people who are doing absolutely nothing and the people who are doing just a little bit more than that, the people who are doing just a little bit more of that are the ones who benefit the most, right? So it's, it's if you're doing nothing, the, the good news is by just doing a little bit, your general health will be improved. And while we don't have all the data for our brains, uh, brain health um, specifically on this topic, it's likely that, it, that, that, that it, it's not that far removed. That just do a little bit more. Do something that you like. Do something that you can turn into a habit. Um, I, I've been giving these talks now for a while. And uh, so I, you know, I, I, I'm tired of listening to myself say all these things. And I started to do some walking and I wasn't a regular walker before, but I, I have begun to do that. And, it be, and it's become a little bit more habitual for me. Um, in the old days, we all, you know, before television, all, all, all these things, um, people used to uh, take an evening constitutional, right? So after dinner, you just take a little walk, right? Because you weren't going to watch television or do all these other things. Uh, 
all these other distractions that we've got uh, these days, right? If you begin to try to make those changes over time, they become automatic. Remember I was talking to you about turning, um, uh, you know, when we're young, everything is new. And as we get older, things become habits. You can develop a new habit so that it might be harder initially, but if you keep at it for a while, you can make these things habits, whatever it is. You know, I, I suggest people do what they like to do. If you like to walk, if you like to be outside, you know, do that. If you like gardening, do, do that. If you have some exercise that you enjoy, you know, a, a, a sport, or, or dancing or anything like that, you know, just do anything, do anything but sit down. Even if you're gonna read your phone, walk around while you read your phone. Even if you're gonna watch TV, walk around in your living room while you're doing that. Um, anything um, other than sitting down. Hope I've made my point. I'm gonna move on. Uh, oh, <laughs> I'm not going to move on because because exercise is good for lots of reasons. It can lower our hypertension. It can help us control our weight. It can it can help improve our mood. It can uh, depending on what kind of exercise you do and where you do it. It can um, improve our social interactions. Uh, um, it can in, improve improve our our, uh, our 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 metabolism. So it, it affects all these other things that we know are important for. Um, or reducing our, our risks of, of dementia. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to mention that's here in blue is hearing loss. Um, hearing loss, um, this figure here on the right is kind of complicated, but what you might be able to notice at least is that there's a bunch of circles and some of the circles are bigger than others. And the, one of the biggest circles is this one up here uh, um, that is associated with hearing loss. We don't know exactly why um, hearing loss um, is, is so strongly apparently linked to the risk of developing a dementia, but um, you know, it could be that sort of use it or lose it sort of thing. So much of our, uh, what we learn and, and, and how we interact with the world is based on listening to the language that, that others produce and the language that we in turn produce. Um, and so um, for whatever reason, um, it's, it's a good uh, idea to get your hearing checked. Um, and you know, so many of us wear glasses and if a few more of us wore hearing aids, that might, you know, that might make the difference. Um, and the other thing is that more recently, it, 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 there's been evidence that um, uh, visual, you know, maintaining your vision is also very important. So there was a recent study, it was, excuse me, it was highlighted in New York Times uh, in January, end of January, and it was a study that just came out at the end of, uh, just, just came out um, this year or the end of last year. And um, it, showed that cataract surgery, people who got cataract surgery were at lower risk of developing a dementia later on. Um, and that wasn't the case for people who had glaucoma surgery. So people, glaucoma is something that sort of robs your vision slowly over time. And if you don't take care of it, it your vision will get worse. But when you have glaucoma surgery, it doesn't automatically improve your vision unlike cataract surgery. When you have cataract surgery, you're, you, know, you talk to someone who's had that or if you've had it yourself, it improves your vision right away um, or, or very, or very quickly. And it appears that cataract surgery, something that can improve your vision um, uh, can have a big effect on or, or some effect on, on risk of dementia. So again, get your ears checked, your eyes checked. Um, other big thing that I want to talk about is, is a healthy diet. So I don't know if you caught my name. My name is Christopher Christodoulou, right? That's, that's not John Smith. I'm, uh, my family's not from around here originally. My family's from, from Cyprus. It's from one of those Mediterranean regions. And uh, like it or not, you know, my, <laughs> my parents made me eat a lot of these uh, Mediterranean things like uh, nuts and grains, lots of olive oil, um, more fruits and vegetables maybe than I wanted when I was younger, but now I like it. And, you know, and I've gotten used to it and I enjoy it. In fact, I prefer it. In fact, um, some fish, some poultry, not so much red meat. Um, 
spicing your foods, not just with salt so that you over salt your food, but with, um, um, uh, you know, uh, spice it up with other herbs and, and, and spices as well. And um, so all these things can make a difference. This pyramid kind of shows kind of proportionally what you should have on your plate, right? So the, the stuff, the most you should have, the stuff that you should have, should have the most of on your plate are whole grains and breads, beans, nuts. Nuts are really good. Um, uh, but beans, pastas, those are, those are real good. You can have just about all you want of those. You can have just about all the fruits and vegetables you want. If you're going to have oils, you know, uh, olive oil is a, is, is a good one. Um, if you're going to have um, some kind of, of animal protein, fish and seafood, a little bit less of that, but but somewhat. You can have some some uh, egg and cheese and poultry, but not so much, right? So smaller amounts, smaller proportions. And then when it comes to red meats and and sweets, the meats and sweets, unfortunately, we we shouldn't be eating quite as much as as we often do, right? So you know when you when you think of the American plate, you you know you put that steak on it, and then you gotta maybe you got your potato and you know a tiny bit of broccoli or whatever, and that's it. But if we reduce the amount of space that the, the steak gets and increase the amount of space that all these other things get, it it can lower our risk. It appears to lower our risk of cognitive decline. So here's a study. Not easy to get people to to follow diets, right? Actually, Mediterranean diet is one of the easier diets to follow actually, um, but not easy to get people to follow a diet, whatever it is. Um, but this was a study that was done in Barcelona over a four-year period, and they gave people, uh, you know, uh, enough of a, a four-year supply of extra virgin olive oil and, and mixed nuts. <clears throat> and the people who got those things and were told to follow that Mediterranean diet in general were uh, thinking better after that four-year period in terms of their uh, overall cognition, their, their flexibility, um, and even uh, somewhat in terms of their memory. So these are all things that, that we can try to do. Um, I'm just about done, um, but I wanna talk to you a little bit about a research that we have going on at Stony Brook, as well as some free cognitive screens that we do. So. Um, because we don't yet have the answers, we're trying to figure out the answers to, to what's going on in, in Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. And so we have a number of studies, some of them used advanced um, uh, image, brain imaging to um, identify what kinds of brain changes are taking place and to look at those things. Some are looking at um, uh, the relationship of mood and, and cognitive decline. Some are focusing on people who were who might have PTSD or and, and, or and who are World Trade Center responders. Some are looking at caregivers specifically and not the patients themselves to look at their immune function and, and, and their health. Um, so all these are studies that you can, uh, if you're interested or you know anybody who might be interested, you can call that number that's at the bottom, 631-954-2323. And then the last thing uh, that I've got highlighted there is that we do free cognitive screening. So in fact, I do them. I do them on Thursday at Stony Brook. I do them at Comac. Um, if somebody asks me, I, I do them uh, at, at someplace else, a little further east on occasion. So um, we do those for free. It, you're not considered a patient when you come in to do this free screening or we're just doing it as a service to the community. We are trying to get people to be in some of our studies. So I might tell you about some of the studies, but you're up under no obligation to do any studies. Oh, in terms of those studies, we you don't have to have cognitive impairment. We need healthy controls to be in all these studies as well. So, um, you know, if you're interested. But the free cognitive screening is, you know, I go through um, some fun and games, as I call it, looking at things like memory and attention, a little bit of language, a little bit of drawing. Um, I ask you a little bit about your background. I give you um, some feedback on whether what you're showing is sort of um, in the area of, uh, seems to be a, 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 of concern or not. And then you follow up with your own um, physician, your healthcare provider. It's completely up to you what you do. Um, but it's a good first step and hopefully a, a not scary first step for people to take because um, we know that people who um, get a handle on these issues early on do better. 
um, and that's why I'm telling you this. Um, so that's basically it for my talk. There were some questions that came up. Um, uh, I've covered a lot of them. Uh, some of the typical ones that multiple people asked involve uh, supplements and things that they can take. Um, and uh, the evidence for the most part is not strong on these supplements. Um, and most of these supplements do not have to, uh, are not regulated by the FDA um, as stringently as, as a medicine. You know, you can, uh, you can call it a health supplement, and, um, but they, they don't have to go through all, all the hoops that a, that a medicine does in order to, be, to show that it, it treats a, um, a disease. Um, there are some supplements like um, uh, uh, turmeric, uh, which is a common uh, spice in um, some Indian food um, that have some um, evidence for them. But some of these other things like Prevagen and other things that you might see advertised on the TV, the evidence is not that strong. And if I had to, uh, if you were asking my advice, you know, you're better off taking, you know, a 10 minute walk than, than taking one, one, one of these pills. Um, one of the other questions I had was about support groups that might be available on Eastern Long Island. And there are two good organizations that I could um, suggest that you contact. Um, one is Parker Jewish. Um, they have a, um, a number, uh, they focus especially on caregivers. Um, Parker Jewish, if you just look them up online, you can find them. The Alzheimer's Association also has a Long Island um, um, uh, section, and they also are um, uh, more than willing to, um, uh, to give you information on support groups. There's, all, there's lots of support groups, both for, for people who have these disorders as well as for family members. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. So we had a few come in. Yes. The first one was, um, can aggression be a possible consequence of dementia? Yeah, so um, there are changes in, in sort of personality, somebody becoming more aggressive or more impulsive can be an early sign, especially if it was something that they never did. But, but it is the case also that sometimes um, uh, dementia can involve sort of an exaggeration of a way that a person has always been. Some, some people have always had kind of a short, <laughs> short fuse, and this can become worse in certain kinds of dementias. Um, it can be the case in Alzheimer's disease or other kinds of dementias. There's a, a form of dementia called frontotemporal dementia, and that can sometimes be associated with changes in aggression, especially. But there are other, other things too. And it could also just be something else going on in the environment. It's important to try to rule those things out. So it's important to just, it, you could always start with your um, uh, primary care physician, but you could also see a specialist, a psychiatrist or a psychologist for this. Um, the other question that came in was, um, are the treatments different from Alzheimer's versus other dementias? Um, so in terms of FDA approval of treatments, um, um, there are only treatments um, that have received FDA approval for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so there are some medicines that can help to treat some of the, um, some, uh, some of the cognitive changes. Um, and there are also changes that, um, but, but, but sometimes those medicines are used for people who have other kinds of dementias, especially things like uh, vascular dementia. A vascular dementia just means there's changes in blood flow to the brain. It could be a, a, a big stroke that someone had, but it could also be a series of very small, small strokes that kind of build up over time. And um, uh, sometimes those medicines are used for that, that form of dementia as well, as well as for other, other forms of dementia. So they can be used sort of what they call off-label, but um, um, uh, you know, all this is, is sort of an area of, uh, of change. And there have been some recent medicines that have been approved by the FDA, but they um, are uh, at, at this time um, available only uh, as part of a clinical trial. 
Um, the next question says, what does sugar do to the brain? And um, where is the cognitive screening done out east? Um, in terms of what sugar does to the brain, um, I can't, I can't, you know, give you, you know, a full expert answer on that. Um, we, uh, it, it, I'll give you sort of a general answer, whether it's as accurate as, as it might be, I, 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 I can't tell you, but, but you know, the foods that we ingest that are real foods, right, that are, that, that come from real plants and real vegetables and things, it takes our bodies some time to um, digest them, right? And that, and that slow digestion over time appears to be better for the body to go through. There are other foods that are processed, like, you know, like, uh, uh, like white, white sugar. That's sort of separated from all the rest of the stuff it came with, and it can get into the bloodstream and get into our brain and get into the rest of our body very quickly. So you, have, you, know, you sometimes have that sugar high that you talk about in kids or in other people as well. And that may be related to um, the fact that those kinds of processed foods uh, tend to uh, lead to this chronic inflammatory response. And it's possible that that is, is one of the reasons that, it, that they are not so helpful. But I, you know, I would defer to, a, uh, to some other uh, experts on that. In terms of where the screens are done out east, the furthest east that I do them regularly is at Stony Brook University itself. Um, but I'm open to coming out um, and doing them, you know, at ELI. Maybe we can work something out um, in, in the future. But right now, they're, they're at Stony Brook University and, at, um, and in Comac. Those are the two locations that I do them regularly on Thursday afternoons. The next question asks, is there a formula for interacting with people with dementia? Um, there isn't any one formula. Um, there are some hints and it, you know, and it can be helpful to, you know, join a support group or to talk with, with, with folks. So, um, you know, the, through the Alzheimer's Association, through Parker Jewish, you might get some good tips and there are all sorts of groups and, and all kinds of education you can get through folks like that. One of the things that, um, you know, in terms of a quick hint that can sometimes be helpful is there, there comes a point when, you know, you can say to your, your mother or your spouse, you know, I told you that, you know, 10 minutes ago, right? Um, they may not be able to benefit from that at some point, right? It's harder and harder for them to learn and to hold on to new information. And Alzheimer's disease, it's one of the earlier symptoms. Um, Early, on, early in the disease process, they can learn, but with some increased effort. But over time, it becomes harder and harder to learn any new information. So constantly reminding the person, um, I told you that five minutes ago, is not going to help you or, or help them. It's, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's better to just sort of uh, nod and, and, and move on, right? Um, there, there are other, other hints. Some of it is is understanding kind of what the if you can understand sort of what the limitations of the are of the person at the time, what kind of progression may have taken place in their disease, you know, understanding that you know some of their changes, um, and it's not just cognitive. Sometimes those changes are emotional. Someone mentioned aggression and things like that. Sometimes those things change, you know, during the course of the illness. People can become agitated. Exercise is good for them, right? So exercise can, can be good for, for people. You don't want them wandering if they don't know, know their way back home. But um, exercise can be helpful in, in dealing with some of those emotional problems as well. So that can be a, a useful thing to try to do. You can try to, you know, sometimes you can try just try to hide things you don't want people to deal with. Um, if you don't want them going outside, you don't, you know, don't put their hat and keys and, and, and coat, you know, where they can see them easily. Um, things like that. Anything else? 
The next um, question that just came through, if someone is diagnosed with MCI, can it be determined if it is Alzheimer's or another dementia? Um, there are, um, you know, people who have um, MCI or mild cognitive impairment are at increased risk of developing some form of dementia, um, but they, it's by no means a sure thing, but they are definitely at increased risk. Um, there are certain kinds of, of early mild cognitive impairment that tend to be more linked to Alzheimer's disease. One of them is having trouble holding on to newly learned information. So what someone told you 10 minutes ago or told you yesterday, if, if the, it's becoming increasingly difficult to hold on to that new information, that can sometimes be um, a, 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 a form of mild cognitive impairment that is at increased risk of, of leading to Alzheimer's. There are some kinds of neuroimaging and some other ways of trying to follow the person over time that can help to um, increase the, your likelihood of being sure that it's Alzheimer's or not. I do not see any other new questions. Let me, uh, um, give me a second. I'm just gonna go through and see if I see any, cause I know that you'd sent me some. Oh, someone asked, uh, someone at, said, asked, what are your thoughts on more than seven glasses of wine for women and aging in the brain? Um, so more than seven glasses of wine in one day is not good, definitely. A, a, um, chronic heavy alcohol use um, is associated with increased risk of cognitive decline and, and of uh, some forms of dementia. Um, seven glasses per week, that is one a day, is sort of the commonly identified level of acceptable. Um, and exactly how much more you would have to go over in order for it to be a problem is hard to say on any individual basis. We never recommend someone start drinking um, uh, in order to benefit their cognition, but um, uh, we usually tell people to uh, drink on, you know, a, a, a only small amount. Thoughts, uh, early signs. Oh, uh, if you have random thoughts while res relaxing, is that an early sign of Alzheimer's? Um, random as in full scenarios like dreams. That was this question. Um, you know, uh, if you're, sometimes people can nod off without realizing they're nodding off or, you know, it's, sometimes that can be an indication of, of sleep changes. Sleep is really, really important. I didn't include that as one of the ways to try to prevent dementias, but we know that sleep problems are often associated with, with, with increased risk of cognitive decline. And we know that especially uh, something called sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea is a big problem. And that is where you uh, stop breathing, at least briefly, while you're asleep. That's bad for your brain. It's bad for your body, but it's bad for your brain, especially. The brain is only, you know, three pounds, right? It's our three pound universe, but it accounts for, it uses up about 20, 25% of all the oxygen we take in and all the, the food that we take in. Um, and so, you have to take care of, of, of your brain. And one way you can do that is by making sure that you're breathing. And so if you are a, a snorer, um, if you are um, um, a very restless sleeper um, or your spouse notices any of these things, it's good to have your sleep checked out to make sure that your sleep is okay because that can help to reduce your risks of, of, uh, of a dementia. Uh, one question. Um just came in in the chat that um, they asked, is there a correlation between parents and then children having dementia? Yeah, so uh, um, it, with that early onset form of dementia, there can be a closer correlation. If a parent gets it before the age of 65, um, the odds of the child getting it are, are, are higher and it's worth you know perhaps doing that genetic testing. There are... Um, uh, but you would talk to your doctor before doing any of that. Um, it, with um, the, the more general uh, kind of, of Alzheimer's, there is some link, but it's not that 
not so strong. Um, and um, there's also the sense that the people who benefit the most from um, some of these preventative measures like exercise and, and diet that I mentioned are, are maybe the people who are at greatest risk. So there's stuff that you can do. You have any other ones? I have one more in the group I could, from that was emailed. Um, somebody asked, "How is Lewy body related to Alzheimer's?" So Lewy body dementia um, is another kind of change in the proteins inside the inside the brain that is uh, identifiable. We can identify this kind of brain change. It's an abnormality. It again leads to um, the death of of brain cells. And so it's a different disease uh, from Alzheimer's disease, um, but it, again, it's a, a brain disease and a, and a progressive uh, uh, form of dementia. Um, hopefully I've explained, somebody's asking the, the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's. And the thing is that Alzheimer's is one of the kinds of dementia. Dementia is the big umbrella. And Alzheimer's is one of those things. It's like a, um, a dog is the big group and, and cocker spaniel is one kind, right? So Alzheimer's is a cocker spaniel and dementia is dog, right? Um, someone asked in the chat, um, so their patient has dementia and he asks, um, how should I deal with him and if he doesn't want to get up um, in the morning and when he gets mad and wants to fight? Mm. Um, you know, there can, be, you know, some of the, of the problems that um, people living with those who have dementia or, or, you know, knowing them and, you know, being friends with them or whatever, whatever the relationship is, is not the fact that the person forgets stuff or that they, you know, they're, they're, they're not thinking as well as they used to. It is, it is some of those behavioral changes, right? So some of, sometimes it can be apathy, not wanting to do anything. Sometimes it can be um, changes in mood, uh, lability, you know, to, um, quick to, to anger or quick to um, cry or um, th those kinds of emotion, exaggerated emotional reactions. Um, and some of that can be uh, dealt with through, um, through medicines. There are some medicines that can help treat those sorts of things. Um, and there are also some behavioral things. So um, people with Alzheimer's, for instance, tend to benefit from a, um, a, a structured um, approach. You know, um, uh, so, uh, the, you know, st going to bed at, 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 at the same time, getting up at the same time, having meals at the same time. Increasing some predictability in, in their lives can, can sometimes make them feel better and thereby make the people who are living with them feel better too. Um, exercise is a good way to, to help um, all of us regulate our moods as well. And there are medicines. And there's some, um, you know, there are support groups for people who have to deal with these, these folks and um, um, where you can get some help. And there's also just therapy for people who are having to deal with these things. Anything else? Someone had asked if Lewy body is caused by anesthesia. Caused by anesthesia. No, um, what they might be referring to or thinking about is that um, uh, sometimes when older folks um, have surgery and are often under uh, general anesthesia, and then they come out of it, um, they they tend to uh, they 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 can be at increased risk of having of showing some cognitive problems. Usually, that person was sort of cognitively vulnerable beforehand, but it is the case that sometimes it can um, uh, kind of tip that person over, at least in the short term. Um, to, to showing more cognitive problems. Sometimes those will go away, but sometimes they don't. So it's important to um, speak with the doctors that are treating them and to uh, see what can, can be done. It, the 
can, it can occur for many different reasons. But, but um, the anesthesia is not going to cause Lewy body dementia. So, um, but, it, but it can make some symptoms uh, appear worse. And there are some things that maybe your doctor can do, or at least you should have that conversation with them. Thank you so much for a very great talk. It was very informative. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. I'm happy to do it anytime. Um, definitely in the future, we'll schedule some talks and hopefully we'll try and get one that's um, in person out here if you'd sure. be interested in, in doing something like that. Sure. Maybe on a Friday, I'll make it a long weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. All right. All right. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay. Bye-bye.